Hi guys, welcome to my review of Once Upon a Time, episode 511, Swan Song. <sighs> I'm sure you can all imagine my feelings about this episode. As a mid-season finale, you expect something big and you expect something dramatic and you expect it to be good, but I can't even begin to explain my feelings about this episode. Firstly, I would like to say I was right! Okay, so I may have given him slightly too much credit because I was in the kind of camp of people, because apparently a lot of people thought this, I don't know why I thought I was special enough to have come up with this on my own, but um, the camp of people who thought that Kelly was planning this all along, um, rather than that it was a kind of like last minute gut decision that Emma was more important to him than anything else. For me, I had decided, if you watch my last video, then you'll know that my theory was that although he was being kind of consumed by this anger, he was using it as a kind of like front to push everyone away, to make everyone hate him and to make Emma feel like he was completely lost to her, that he wasn't Kelly and Jones anymore, that he was just the dark one and that the man that she loved had died in Camelot and that he was planning to do that to get her to be willing to sacrifice him. Which was what it all came down to, only he hadn't actually been planning that all along, he really had been consumed by the darkness and it was only at the moment that he saw the real, very real imminent threat to Emma happening that his love for her pulled him out of that darkness and made him sacrifice himself for her and her family. I cried so much watching this episode that it would have been funny if it wasn't so upsetting. I sort of teared up on and off throughout the episode but then when it got to that scene and we all know what that scene was, I was just an absolute wreck. So the bulk of the episode obviously was dealing with Hook's past and his relationship with his father which was something that I'm so glad that we got to explore in this episode because it's something that we've not got to see before and much as though we've learned about his past as an adult we never had had the opportunity to get to know about his past as a child so to find out that he was an orphan too he felt so abandoned by his father which was something that Emma obviously felt throughout her entire childhood was that she felt that she'd been abandoned by her parents and that nobody wanted her and so Killian went through something very similar only he actually had a parent there, he had a father there who obviously he adored and then was abandoned by him. To not only just be abandoned but to be actually kind of traded and sold into child slavery essentially um, can obviously pinpoint a, a starting point in the past kind of dark side that kind of lives within him. Um, we can kind of start to see now where that all started and why that all started. I really liked the actor that they chose to play his dad. I actually thought that that felt quite believable. And a scene that I really, really enjoyed was the scene between him and his dad as adults. Um, when Regina had sent him, I'll get to that in a minute, but when Regina had sent him to try and kill his father um, and they had that conversation and you saw that his Killian's first kind of instinct was that he wanted revenge and that he wanted to punish this man but once he kind of talked to him and reconnected with him in that way he was willing to give him this other chance and it showed that at that point he hadn't given in to complete darkness and revenge. I thought that that was a really interesting scene, I thought it was very well acted. Again something that I'm going to get to later on in terms of the acting in this episode just oh my god Colin O'Donoghue like Oh, like he and Jane particularly because I'm obviously very invested in the Captain Swan relationship but everybody in this episode, Robert Carlyle, Emily Duraven, Lana, everyone was just like on form but Colin, because this was quite a kind of Hook slash Killian Jones centric episode, Colin really got to just show off so many different sides to his acting. In fact I'm going to just talk about this now because I've started now so I might as well keep going. Um, but he just got to show so many sides to his acting acting talent and so many sides to that character so we had the flashbacks so we got to see kind of old troubled Captain Hook who hadn't quite gone completely over the edge yet but who was on a quite a dark path and then we got to see Dark One Hook who was just maniacal and had kind of lost all sense of control and was quite terrifying frankly and then obviously in the end we got to see the man that he really is and that heartbreaking moment um, which I'll deconstruct and talk about in more detail after I've finished ranting about the joy that was watching Colin O'Donoghue on screen um, was just so beautifully done and 
that that moment and Jake and Jostle, you know I love Jake and Jostle's reviews. I still haven't actually liked their channel, I don't think so. I'll link it in the description box down below. So please go and check it out. If you like Once Upon a Time, you will love their reviews. Um, if you can put up with my reviews of Once Upon a Time, where I sit and talk like this, you will love Jake and Jostle's because they have the joy of actually having two people. So um, they do what I do, or Jostle certainly does what I do in terms of her Captain Swan feelings. Um, but she's got someone to kind of bounce her ideas off so go and watch their videos because they're great but they talked in sort of detail about that moment that I'm about to talk about now when he was sort of going with the Dark Ones and Nimue was standing there and he was all poised and ready to get his revenge but in that moment when Nimue started to strangle Emma and basically said I might not be able to kill you but I can stop you and she was kind of choking her from a distance and there was just this like really long close-up of Colin Donahue's face and you just saw him just it was the most subtle and brilliantly done thing because he didn't do a lot he really didn't do much it was really just this case of looking at his face and it went it just a subtle change that you knew just as that happened that Killian Jones was back and evil Dark One Hook was banished to the underworld of horror and awfulness but you knew you just could see in that moment that that click and that tiny little flicker on his face that it was just like this is it I can't do this this is too important this woman is too important to me and I will not let these evil creatures do this to her oh my god it was amazing and I'm just oh I'm genuinely so excited like I want more like I think what we'll get hopefully in 5b um, is more nice Captain's One moments but there's obviously still going to be a lot of drama he is now dead which again we will get to in a minute but hopefully we'll still have some kind of conflicted stuff going on for Hook's character because he is now in the underworld and I think what I've read quite a lot of interviews with Adam with Eddie with the cast talking about 5B and it feels like 5B is going to be very focused on dealing with kind of past demons and unfinished business and dealing with things that you've gone through in the past so I you know we're getting a lot of old cast members coming back for the 100th episode so I kind of feel like maybe we're going to get certain characters getting closure on certain situations that they never really got closure on before so I feel like that will present some really good opportunities for Colin to be as incredible as he has been in the past couple of episodes and obviously I have to talk about Jane because he just broke my heart in this episode you could see everything that she's gone through and everything that she's been put through in her life and gone through to get to this point and to be so open to this relationship and be so happy to be with him and just realising that it's all going to be torn away. You could see that guilt in her face of not only that feeling of betraying Killing because he didn't want to be the Dark One so that she knew that by saving him even though it was what she wanted because she couldn't lose him she you know was ultimately going to end up losing him anyway um, but not only that, but realising that everything that everyone else was going through, so everything that were her family were going through, that Regina was going through, that everyone was about to be put through, going to be dragged to the underworld and used as kind of like vats for the souls of the Dark Ones. Um, all of that was happening because of the decision that she made, so it was this very conflicted guilt that she had where all of her love for Hook was trying to convince her that she'd made the right decision. Um, but she could see how it was affecting everyone around her. That moment where she's standing in Granny's and she's written the letter to say that she's going to sacrifice herself and she looks out and she sees Mary Margaret and David and Neil and who, by the way, has not grown at all. <laughs> has anyone noticed this? That baby has not got any bigger and I don't actually know how long, how old he's supposed to be now. Has everything, because Neil was born before Emma and Killian went to, went into the past which is quite a while ago, so anyway, I don't really know what's going on there. But anyway, when she was looking through it and she saw Mary Margaret and David and Neil and Henry and they were all sitting and it was her looking at these people who she didn't feel like she was a part of anything, she didn't feel like she was a part of a family, she didn't feel like she had anyone in the past growing up through her childhood and you just see that look in her face when she's standing there looking at them going, these are the people that I love more than anything and I'm about to lose them and... Oh, the fact that she then was just willing to sacrifice herself for everybody again for like the second time or the third time or whatever number of time it is now, um, I think just goes to show such incredible character growth and development and progression and everything that she is now um, in comparison to season one. And apparently I chose not to indulge in the like unhappy tweets. I don't really look at like 
Twitter feed where people are complaining. But apparently there have been people complaining and saying like, oh, Emma's not the character she was in season one. Like, she's totally changed. And it's like, mm hmm yeah, she's grown and developed and become someone who is open to having a family and having a relationship and having friends and trusting people. And she's grown into this character who who she wasn't in, this, in, in the season one because she had all her walls and her guards up. And now she's literally lying on the ground, crying over the dead body of the man that she loves, who she's just had to sacrifice to save the world from the darkness in absolute bits and can't even begin to cope with the loss that she's feeling, which she would not have felt in season one because she wouldn't have even opened up enough to have the relationship in the first place. So excellent writing and character development and growth and everything is just oh, spot on. Jane can do just some of the facial expressions that she does and it's just little things, but just the looks that kind of come over her face at some point, you just think, you're actually just genuinely trying to break my heart right now. So throughout the whole episode, I was still kind of trying desperately to hold on to the hope that Helene wasn't completely dark, that he hadn't completely lost his sense of who he was and that he'd let the darkness overtake. But in the flashback scenes where we've seen him and Regina kind of, not working together, but her recruiting him and testing him, which I really enjoyed, by the way. There was a really interesting chemistry between Hook and Regina at that point. Um, not that anything I would ever imagine would have happened and I wouldn't want anything necessarily to happen but I felt that there was something quite interesting an interesting dynamic between them back then I love seeing Lana back in her evil queen attire and attitude and she's just got so much sass um, Regina has so much sass all the time but seeing her back as the evil queen always just really entertains me and she does it so so well so I enjoyed that a lot and I loved seeing that interaction between them in a place that is not kind of where we are now um, because they've always had that kind of like very much bickering intolerant of each other sort of relationship and so to kind of see them in the past in a totally removed situation where Emma's not there, Mary Margaret and David aren't there and Henry's not there, it's a very different scene to see them in and I really enjoyed that. She was back to her old typically wicked ways in wanting to recruit him um, to taste him and her test was to try and get him to kill his dad. Something she'd already succeeded in doing in her own life. Um, but yeah, her kind of plan was to have him kill his dad to prove what kind of man he was. And it was a really interesting turn. And I love how they did that because the whole kind of episode, the whole focus of this episode, from, from that opening scene on the boat where his dad said to him, you have to grow up and decide what kind of man you want to be. And as a kid, he's been like, I want to be like you, dad. And his dad's like, yes, yeah, son. And then totally goes off and abandons him and leaves him him and his brother alone and um, so I thought that that was such an interesting way of dealing with the situation we were in now in Storybrooke because we were looking back at his entire life has been a question of what sort of man do I want to be and he's gone from being a good man when he and his brother were together in the navy to then feeling that loss and feeling that disconnection and becoming a pirate and going a little bit off the rails then everything happening with Rumpelstiltskin and Mila and him going completely off the rails and then we've got this moment where Regina's giving him this option to say I need to know what kind of man you are you've got to kill someone here's the person I want you to fight and it turns out to be his long lost dad who's abandoned him and you saw in that that after talking to him his instinct was to go no I'm going to give this person another chance which shows that he is a good person and then he tried to give him another chance rocked up at his house the next day and discovers that his new son, who he's, you know, had all these years later, who he has named Liam, which got to be a bit of a kick in the guts, um, that your father... I mean, it's got to be a kick in the guts simultaneously that, you know, your father named his new son after your older brother because he didn't name him after you, but also at the same time. Like, what an insult. It's like, oh, just replace them with these new children kind of thing and that really hurt and you saw as he watched his father say exactly the same thing to this little boy that he'd said to him when he was a child and he was like no I'm not going to let you do this to another child and he did end up killing his father which you just think oh my god to have that on your conscience for your entire life and not to mention the fact that he was already on a kind of like revenge streak with the rumple situation it would be very difficult not to get tempted again by the darkness. 
And that's what's been so amazing to watch because when we met him as a villain and throughout all the next few seasons we've seen that his relationship with Emma and the fact that they are these kind of kindred souls and that relationship that they've had has changed him as a person and made him into the man that he wanted to be which was reflected in that very climactic and horrible scene. This whole episode he's just given in to all these dark instincts because I think he just feels like what's the point anymore I'm I've worked so hard to get to a place where I'm not tempted by the darkness anymore and that I'm in a happy place and now I've been kind of thrown back thrown back to the wolves kind of thing um by the women that I love what's even the point anymore and you just saw him kind of letting go and thinking what like I don't want to be here I don't want to be this so I'm not I'm I'm gonna choose to think that I'm not who I was anymore I am just the dark one and that's fine and then it wasn't until the actual moment of that real threat because everything else was all sort of variable threats and implications and it wasn't until there was that actual genuine moment of like I am watching the woman that I love be strangled and her entire family are about to be dragged to the underworld which is sort of like hell but I think in Once Upon a Time not quite going to be hell um, and it was just that click where it was like actually no I know what kind of man I want to be and oh my god it's just oh it's so good it's, it's so heartbreakingly beautifully written and I was an emotional wreck but also felt quite hopeful because I was like the fact that he died I think I'd sort of prepared myself for the fact that he was going to die because I decided in my last review as you know I just had a panic there that I hadn't been recording I was like oh my god see if I've sat and talked like this and I haven't been filming and I've sat on my own in my living room for half an hour ranting at the camera that would be embarrassing but anyway um it's all good so yeah I think I'd kind of mentally prepared myself for the fact that he was probably going to die um and that that was going to be horrible but I think because I had done that I I was more just emotional about the acting and the quality of that scene and the writing and how reflective it was of the Captain Swan relationship and all the parallels to other relationships which I'm going to talk about in a minute um, so I think my emotions were very much devastated because I didn't want him to die but at the same time that scene just was just so beautiful that I kind of just felt hopeful through it which probably sounds insane. You just saw, I mean he'd been so awful to her in that last episode but she'd never stopped trying to kind of fight for for him. It wasn't until this episode that she was like no I have to accept that the man that I loved has died, he died in Camelot and this isn't him anymore and then seeing her realising that it was him and that he has come back to her and that he is about to give up his entire life for her and for her family and you see that realisation dawning on her and then just everything that they said to each other and really it, it was just very very simple things but she said I can't, I don't want to lose you and he said I don't want to lose you, she said I love you, he said I love you and it was, it was, it was just like simple things but they just meant so much and they were so reflective of everything that's come before this moment and it just, if this was the end, like, oh, I can't even begin to imagine how I would have felt if that had been the end of their story. Um, thankfully, I think we're going to have some very, I hope we're going to have some very good stuff in 5B um, to kind of follow up from this, but I think just seeing the point that they've got to is just, just amazing. Continuing on with this kind of thread because I might as well get all of my Captain Swan feels out at the same time. There is a blog, I've talked about it before and again I haven't linked it but I will be linking it down below because you have to go and check this out. Um, her Twitter name is The Girly Nerd and I'm about to check her blog name. Her blog name is also The Girly Nerd um, and she writes Captain Swan related posts and Once Upon a Time reviews and stuff. Um, and so she wrote an article a few weeks ago which I loved and I've mentioned before talking about the significance of hands and hearts in the Captain Swan relationship. Now, if you have been quite invested in this you'll probably know this already, you'll probably have picked up on it but there is a lot of investment in hands and hearts throughout this story from the very very beginning even if you think about it right back to the very first time that they kind of interacted with each other. That ever so iconic moment up in the beanstalk when he wraps her hand up when she's cut it um, that is a kind of starting point where there's kind of an attention to their hands that may have been accidental but as the story has gone on and progressed we've seen continual reference to their hands and their hearts there have been so many close-ups of 
them holding hands and their kind of fingers interlocking and there's been very much like I don't know if part of that is well, he only has one hand but you know um there's there's been a lot of kind of attention to that and just that as like a subtle kind of show of that connection between them um but also hearts and if you will have noticed that since the season four situation when he had his heart torn out by rumple um and then she managed to put it back in um so often in so many scenes she has her hand on his chest and it's maybe i don't know if jane decided to do that or if because that's something that um that you'll read about in these blog posts if you go and read them. So I'm not sure if that was an acting decision on Jane and Colin's part or if it was something that was actually written into the script. But regardless, it's something that happens a lot and they have talked about their hearts in that sort of fairy tale style that we've had so much connection between Snow and Charming and talk of hearts. And everyone's heart is, is a major part of this story, but they've referenced it throughout the time that they've been together. And um, the fact that she was the one to put his heart back in his chest, the fact that he had that line in season four when he said that he hopes that he's the one to protect her heart and whatever, it's all very much built into the story. And so the fact that they are kind of going to hopefully be replicating the Snow and Charming situation to just add to the Snow and Charming, like the snowing parallels are just, there are so many. Um, but the fact that they are hopefully going to also share a heart, much like Snow and Charming, if they are able to do that, which is the only way really that they're going to be able to save him, I, um, I can't even, to go from, like, and also I think what's nice is back in season three in Neverland, because I got my kind of like Captain Swan feels really kind of started in Neverland. I really liked him as a character in season two and I loved the chemistry between the actors. But I wasn't overly invested in the Captain's One relationship until Neverland, really. Um, and that line, that line where he said, when I win your heart, I'll, it will be because you want me and it won't be because of any trickery. And it's like, oh my God, you've literally won a piece of her heart. Like literally half of it is now going to be in your chest. <sighs> and it's what's going to save your life. And it's just too perfect for words. I'm going to stop with my Captain Swan stuff now because I could go on forever and I have to mention some other stuff. I loved the Regina Zelina scene. I love, oh, I loved so much when Robin and Regina walked into Regina's old office and Zelina was sitting there and she was like, Gina, Robbie, and you're like, oh, she's just such an utterly ridiculous character and, and at times so unbearable to watch, but just, oh, Rebecca Mader is incredible. She's so, so good and she plays that character so well. And what Jake said in Jake and Jostle's review, I think it was Jake, was that she never kind of drops out of her kind of wicked character. Um, lots of the other villains go, they kind of flounce between, between good and evil because the whole point of the show is that no one's completely entirely evil. But I think Zelina just had this, has this like slightly manic wickedness about her constantly that is just so entertaining. And then when she's talking through the paint colours and saying like, oh, these would be good baby names. And you're thinking, you cannot have this child. Dear heavens, please keep this little girl from her. The fact that Rudino is able to send her back to Oz is excellent for the time being, but I really do want to see more of Zelina in the next season because she amuses me a lot. Right, obviously something very huge that I haven't talked about yet and it's terrible that I haven't touched on this yet, but the Rumpel storyline throughout this episode was fantastic. And while to begin with, when I watched it initially, my first instinct was to be like, oh, what? Are you actually kidding me? I think it's very clever because I think it's very, very reflective of Rumpel as a character. I loved that he had that selfless moment of sending Belle out of town to get her away from what was about to happen. He couldn't bear to have her dragged to the underworld. And um, so he sent her away and he said, go and explore the world and go and see everything that you want to see. And, you know, she was sort of thrilled because this was a moment that he was being really kind of too to her and being respectful of her wishes and she was so happy and it was sad because you at that point were thinking oh she doesn't know what's going to happen and he's going to be dragged away to the underworld and um so throughout the episode i'd felt quite sorry for him and i was thinking he has changed and he's become a good guy oh and then in that final moment you're like actually you're not i read an interview again with adam and eddie talking about that scene and talking about the fact that for them they felt that this was a crime of opportunity so rumples already felt like he'd lost bail she'd left town he'd sent her away and so with her gone he was facing death and something that rumple has always done is look out for himself and find ways to kind of cheat and escape and survive 
and he saw this opportunity to manage to get the dagger back and to take all the power of all of the dark ones which in a rational person's brain would be like actually no I'll probably be better off for everyone if I just die he can't do that because Rumpel has always had a love for that power in a way that I think is quite different to the other people who have succumbed to the darkness. There was a line where Hook said, which I think was really good, um, that Rumpel has always loved that dagger and that dagger has always meant something to him and that it maybe didn't mean to other dark ones. I don't know if it's because he was the dark one for such a long time, but he seems to have this sense of control over it to an extent that I don't think anyone else who who becomes the dark one seems to have and um, so from a character point of view I actually think it's very clever and I think that it works well. I also think from a storyline point of view this was something that had occurred to me but I was like if they do destroy the darkness so if Killian sacrifices himself or Emma because for a while we were thinking it was her, if anyone sacrifices themselves to get rid of the darkness then well, it can't just, there can't just not be any darkness anymore, do you know what I mean? Like, it can't just be that everything's light and happy because that's, there's not going to be a story then. So I did wonder what was going to happen with that, um, but I did not see that coming. What makes it so heartbreaking from uh, the plot point of view is that then everything that Killian sacrificed himself for was kind of in vain and from a, his character development point of view it wasn't because it just showed that he it absolutely showed what kind of man he wanted to be and in that moment when he was given that choice you saw the kind of person that he wanted to be and he wanted to be that for Emma and for her family and um, the wind and rain is so bad right now and so that was amazing um, but then in reality in terms of the actual effect of his death it's been ruined because Rumpel's still the dark one not only that he has the power of every dark one who's ever lived so who knows what he's going to be getting up to next. I think for Emma it was a conflicting situation because obviously she's horrified that the man that she loves has died kind of in vain. Um, but at the same time the fact that Rumpel has that darkness means that she has now got a path to the underworld to potentially save him. Belle and Rumpel are also now back together and so the betrayal that she is going to feel when she realises what he's done is going to be like tenfold what it's been before. And that's us now, done, until March. I don't know, I don't want to have to wait until March for the next episode, but I think, I think because of the way that they did it, they, um, they did such a good thing, I think, by having the kind of climactic scene about five minutes from the end, so you had that five minutes to like calm down and then realise that actually, no, there is a way to get him back. So if the episode had ended with Emma having to stab him, which was just, I mean, if it wasn't bad enough that she's about to lose the love of her life, she's the one who has to plunge the sword through his chest. I mean, really, that moment just about destroyed me. And then seeing Snow and Charming comfort her was just so sad because that was that kind of like parental moment where they were taking care of their daughter who's just lost the love of her life. Um, was really, oh, that was hard to watch, but it was just lovely. Um, and so I think it was good that they did all of that and then had that kind of moment for Emma to kind of click and think, no, there's got to be a way, I want to find a way to do this and get him back and to save him. Um, and then seeing that final scene where they are on their way to the underworld. So you know that next season is going to be incredible and you have hope that he is not lost forever. So I think that's it. I don't think I've got anything else to say. I do. I could talk about this all day, but I'm going to curb it there and say no more. We have talked about this enough. I'm looking forward to next season from the point of view that they're bringing back some other characters. I think like the Cora stuff's going to be really good and I hope that we're like Mila's coming back. So I think there's probably going to be really interesting scenes between Hook and Mila and Rumpel and Mila and maybe the three of them together. Like there could be something really interesting there. Um, and as long as we get like a really lovely Captain Swan reunion, I am excited for March. So let me know in the comments down below how you felt about this episode, what you thought, if you agree with me, if you think I'm insane. I really, really enjoyed that. It was very emotionally upsetting. I thought last night because I knew that I had missed like stuff, like there was stuff that I had that I would not have picked up on. Like one thing that I didn't pick up on the first time that I watched that scene, that scene was that um after she's like been crying into his chest and he's been like you have to let me die hero like you have to let me be the man i want to be that's who i want you to remember me as and i was like oh like can't even cope with this 
Um, so after that, and she's standing back and she's holding the sword and she knows that she has to do this, he just kind of like gives her one of those little like encouraging nods that he gives her at like times of trial. So when, you know, she's having to do, she, there's been so many instances where she's had something she's been about to do and she's been scared of, and he's just giving her this like little encouraging nod. You're like, oh, this time you're giving her that nod to stab you to death. Oh, what even? And then he said, it's okay. And you're like, it's so not okay. But I missed that the first time that I watched it. I didn't see the nod or hear the it's okay because I was crying my eyes out. I tweeted about this, but I went back last night and I was like, it's been a solid 24 hours. It's been a good amount of time. I can go back and watch that scene in a calm, rational manner so that I know everything about it for when I'm reviewing it. And I watched about 30 seconds of it and was bawling my eyes out. <laughs> Hopefully at some point I'll be able to rewatch the whole episode and give it, you know, my proper full attention. Um, but I really hope that you enjoyed this review. I hope you've enjoyed all of my reviews of f season five so far. Let me know if you have in the comments down below and give this video a thumbs up to encourage me to keep making them next season. I hope that you're all having an amazing week. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to keep up with my reviews next season, you can hit the subscribe button. Thanks again, guys. I hope you're having a great week. I'll speak to you again soon. Bye. I'm kind of hoping that he, he wants to push Emma to the point that she thinks that he can't be redeemed and then she's happy to let him die and with him the darkness will die. Does that make sense?